the last time we spoke, uh, you you said something really interesting. You said, you know, when you were in work and you were in the, in the, you know, in the height of your addiction, you said that people, your colleagues at work thought you were an alcoholic. And that was okay. And that, and that was almost acceptable. It was funny, it was. And I often tell the story, like on my very last, when when, when, um, when they were trying to get me out with a job for, for very good reasons, I was falling asleep everywhere, like it was horrific. And I was in a meeting with the union and the very last meeting um, I, I went to to try to keep my job because I was falling asleep at the workplace and he knew I had a drug problem. I fell asleep at that meeting. I didn't realise I fell asleep at that meeting and I said to my union reps after, who was also my manager, that went well, didn't it? And he was looking at me saying, what? You fell asleep. <laughs> I'm like, oh. And there was one of the managers, he was the factory manager at that meeting. Um, he's retired now, so he won't mind me saying it. Um, he's retired from the company and he won't mind me saying it. But only a couple of months previous to that, like it was all, I only heard back on this uh, after the event. And he says, ah, sure, what's you call it? He, says, he, just, he, just, he just loves his alcohol, his gargle. So we all have a few drinks. We all enjoy our enjoy, enjoy a few drinks. Mm -hmm. And he would have had a bit of a drinking issue as well. So like management, it's not, it's not just the staff of companies that might have drinking issues. Management, leaders, CEOs can have drinking issues as well. Yeah. So it makes it, and in Ireland, in England, in most countries, to be quite honest, it's, it's, it's a worldwide problem. Problem. Alcohol is just more accepted. And we went over to Ghent um, on a couple of occasions uh, to a, a company called Barco Graphics. Barco, they're called Esco Graphics then after that they merged. But they have a big, huge facility, a big uh, graphics uh, facility where they train people up. And we used to love going over there. Like, uh, I'll give you an, I'll give you a few examples of this. This just goes, shows how crazy it is. So they had a tap in the uh, in 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 the canteen a beer tap like so you go in you can get a beer but you see the odd person getting a beer but we were like so excited by this oh my god they have a beer tap in here and we were bringing glasses of beer into the second half of the class with us all, as a cure because we were so hung over from the night before and I remember one time me and a friend of mine went over to Esco and we went over and we had to collect all the receipts to go back through um, so they can give it to the company. And we're supposed to collect restaurant receipts and all and not show we were drinking 24-7. When we got back, uh, we got back to the airport. Well, I can't remember anything from that from the holiday. We actually call it holiday to the N the MD one time. And he says, a holiday? <laughs> we were over training now. But we were called into the office because all our receipts were alcohol. And he says, the, the financial director looked at us and says, look, one of these the triple vodkas and Red Bull when he's at home in the airport after he's got home, like, this just isn't acceptable. And we thought that was funny. And we were telling other people what happened and thought it was hilarious. And other people were laughing. So it's like, that's, when I look back on that now, that's really sad. It's really pathetic when I look back on that. It wasn't funny. It was someone that couldn't cope with emotional pain or anxiety. And I was drinking myself into oblivion on that trip because I couldn't bring heroin over with me. And it was just really, really sad. But I think back to the Irish thing, we just laugh about these things. And, and you know what this, the thing is? It is kind of funny at the time. Like these stories yeah. to be funny and it is, there's, there's a banter within that. But I just think we have it very mixed up in terms of what's funny and what's not funny and where to draw the line. Lots of Irish people, myself included, would almost like now, uh, even now would associate um, alcohol with a reward, if you like, at the end of a busy week, you know, busy working day. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a beer or two. It's a glass of wine, whatever it is. That's the reward. It's like yeah. a reward. I wonder, is there anything? Is there is there a way to? remove that reward or to or to change it up mix it at least mix it up a little bit a big part of any behavior or any bad habit is the reward if there was no reward the behavior whether good or bad would not continue that's the that's the, the be all and end all any any habits are like that but when you look at you say a reward it's really interesting so for me phd and mm -hmm. um, at the moment i'm doing uh, i'm doing the, the whole literature review around that and i'm looking at substance misuse and looking at the prevalence of alcohol and stuff like that and i'll just give you a few stats that actually blew me away so globally 2.4 billion people are current drinkers but 100 million of those have alcohol use disorders there's 3 million deaths per year from alcohol mm -hmm. that's 5.3 percent of the deaths worldwide are down to alcohol and in the u.s alone it costs the healthcare system 
223 billion. So the stats on that are absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. And you says, yeah, you, people drink it as a reward. And I am looking into drinking motives as part of my PhD. And like they go into enhancement motives, uh, conformity, all this academic jargon. But I was thinking, right, why do people drink? In lay terms, why do people drink? And I think any bad habit, alcohol included, it's to fill a gap of something that's missing. I truly do believe that's what it is, whether it's connection, meaning, purpose, or to escape emotional pain, whether it's trauma, heartbreak, or stress stress or anxiety but even low level anxiety or something like that like you just want to i'll have a drink to to just loosen up so when i asked all of these people about why they drank i was actually interested in this from a lay perspective and i stuck it up on my instagram i was like i'm gonna do a little uh, trial now usually i'd get about five ten percent of people responding to an instagram poll like that but out of 1500 people that seen the message I think I had 400 responses, crazy amount of responses. And it just shows that everyone has an opinion on this. Here's the different answers. And I, I said they put, uh, put them together into groups. So relaxation to unwind, relieve stress and anxiety, boredom, to switch off, to feel more confident, fit in with the crowd, numb emotional pain, meet other people, escape reality, permission to go crazy, loosen up and generally feel better about themselves. And I found it strange because when I was chatting to you and reward was in there once or twice, but it was very few that actually says a reward at the end of the day. So I think a reward is like maybe the healthier version of it. If you're looking at just a little reward to, to, to boost myself, but it's how often you do that as well. And then addiction or problematic drinking or whatever way you want to look at that, it really only becomes, <clears throat> there's lots of definitions of that. But when it starts causing problems in other areas of your life, when you're drinking every day and someone else has a problem and you can't stop, that's when it becomes very, very problematic. So you have to get at the core of the issue. So eliminating the alcohol is not, that's just a behavior. And we're going to be talking about this as well. Eliminating the alcohol is not good enough. You need to work on something deeper. So my problem was anxiety. Anxiety drove me towards trying to anesthetize myself into oblivion. So once I sorted out my anxiety issues, I didn't have an addiction issue and a need and a motivation to drink or do drugs. I have uh, I was three years clean. I was wondering, like, could I have a drink again? Could I have a glass of wine? I didn't really want to, to be quite mm. honest. It's weird that I've done that. And it's probably a bit dangerous at the time. But I remember, like, well, I don't really, I'm not really, I haven't got an issue. I, have a, I don't really want this, to be quite honest. And for me, energy is the currency of life. I love having energy. I love doing what I do and putting as much time into things that I do. So I can have a glass of wine today, but I don't really like doing it. I don't see it as a reward. I see it as a punishment because the following day, I'm like, oh, my energy, even for my glass, my energy levels are a little bit low. So it's interesting. In that moment, it gives me a little bit of reward, but it doesn't, I'm not stressed and I'm not anxious. So it doesn't relieve anything. I'm not going through emotional pain. So it's not rewarding me with that. So sometimes alcohol, the alcohol isn't the reward. It's what it removes is the reward. So you can have, in in psychological terms, it's called positive reinforcement. So it's like, give you something. If I give you money, it's you're positively reinforced. People work because it's a reward. The money is the reward. They're going to work more because they're getting paid. Take that money away, they'll stop working. That's the basic behavioral Mm -hmm. science behind that. But with alcohol, they might think alcohol is the reward. But if that's relieving stress or anxiety, it's taking something away. That's the real reward. So I think when it comes to alcohol, you might get a little bit of a buzz, but it also takes something away. So you're getting a double dose of a reward. And that's what can make it very addictive and very problematic uh, over time. When I was kind of growing up and it was 15, 16, 17 and, and discovering alcohol for the first time, I guess all the, the role models around me, friends or people that were a little bit older, they were kind of doing the same thing. So this was just a done thing. This is what you did. You went out and you kind of got hammered on a, on a Friday or a Saturday night if you could afford it. Now I'm seeing 15, 16, 17 year olds and it's not ideal either, I would say, but... I don't have as much of an issue with this now as many do. Let's say with the Instagram generation, which they're following some some guy or girl in a gym and maybe they're not following proper techniques. You know, they're not, they're lifting heavy weights and they yeah, probably shouldn't yeah. this kind of thing. I think that's a much better role model than when I when I was growing up. I wouldn't have minded having these guys or these girls to look up to. And- Even watching that Jack Charlton documentary, like oh, they yeah. were going to the pub and having peas and chips and a few beers and then going to play their match the next day. Like it's crazy. Now yeah. it was 11 playing field. I think a lot of people were doing that, but then the Europeans were back to the Europeans. They yeah. start setting the bar of no clean. Don't 
diets, no alcohol. And all of a sudden, Europe went levels above, beyond England and Ireland in terms of football. So we had to, we had to um, catch up with them and, and stop that kind of behavior. But that role model thing is key. Uh, you spoke you spoke there about your own kind of path to recovery. Um, let's say for anyone listening in or maybe facing their own challenges, their own you know, addictive behavior and whatever it might be, you know, is, is there a defined path for everyone or does that very much depend on the individual? It very, very much depends on the individual for the most part. It really does. There's this thing basically known as the ABC of any behavior, any habit, any behavior, it, any any habit, basically bad habit is based on the ABC model. A is for, it's for antecedents, but let's call it a trigger. So A is for a trigger, B is the behavior, and C is the reward. Let's say an example before COVID, I and mean, we'll talk about alcohol. So before COVID, you're coming home from the pub and you're driving home from work on a Friday, you're a little bit stressed and you drive past the pub, right? So there's a setting event, an internal trigger, stress, an external trigger, the pub. You say, right, I'm going to go for a drink. And you might, you probably have to go home for dinner, but it primes you to go for a drink. So you say, right, I'm going to have a drink later. So the behavior is the drinking. And then the C is the consequence. It's the reward. And if it's a if it's rewarding and it relieves the stress or it gives you the buzz, whatever you want, loosens you up, all those things, the, the reasons we get people to drink, well, that habit will increase over time or will persist and be sustained over time. So let's say someone then during COVID, they're in lockdown, they're stressed out of their heads, their kids are wrecking their heads. That's a, a, a trigger. And it could be a bigger trigger. So give me a bloody drink. They're going to drink. They're going to go to the office and have, have, an, have an alcoholic, have a drink. The, the consequence is they'll get relief. They'll be unstressed and they'll wake up the next day even more anxious. And that's another trigger to have another drink and then get rewarded as well. And this can be really dangerous with alcohol as well because people drink because they're anxious, but alcohol causes anxiety. So it's just this circular motion and this behavioral loop that gets in play. But if you want to change your patterns of behavior or alcohol use or whatever, it's, um, whether it's emotionally and smartphone use, being an angry person, any bad habits work the same way. Right. So, but I'm going to talk about it in terms of alcohol use. So the first thing you have to do is you have to change your environment, change the triggers, right? So triggers can be external alcohol in the press, get rid of it, get rid of the alcohol from the house. Mm -hmm. But then your internal triggers as well. Now, it's very hard to change stress and anxiety. It's a more difficult thing to do than getting rid of the alcohol. But what you could do is, like, that's where self-care comes in. Meditation, gratitude, those kind of techniques. Work on yourself. But there's a great uh, idea in recovery circles known as HALT. It's an acronym for hungry, angry, lonely, tired. If you're hungry, you'll be hungry. You might think, I need a drink. You're not, you're just craving food. You could be just thirsty. If you're angry, you might be more susceptible to having a, a drink. If you're lonely, same thing, lack of connection. There's a great line by a guy called Johan Harry. Sobriety is not the opposite of addiction. Connection is. So if you're lonely, reach out and talk to someone. And tired. If you're tired, you're just like, oh, give me a drink. I'm just, you're just lethargic and you don't want to do anything positive. So change your environment inside and out is absolutely key. Changing the reward is really, really important as well. And if you work on stress and anxiety, well, it's not going to be as rewarding. But let's say in a more tangible note, go and buy 0% uh, Heineken. So the ritual is still there. Yeah. You're going, but it won't be as rewarding because it's not relieving the stress. It's not giving you that buzz. So try that for a while. If you really want to reduce your drink, you'll be changing the reward part of the ABC. But it's also really important to track your behaviors and to shine awareness on the problem. So, And then the other one is replace the behavior with positive routine. So I already talked about that already, like changing your environment, your inside environment. So, We'll do something else. Read a book, go for a jog, go for a stroll, walk in nature. Replace the bad behaviors with positive routines. There's people out there that have a positive relationship with alcohol, that are in control, and they, they, they genuinely understand what moderation is. And just as just like you might have a you're you're entitled to like an unhealthy meal if your nutrition is spot on, you have look, you have a big you know, really bad pizza every now and then, a burger, not the end of the world. Like you're, 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 yeah. allowed, you're allowed to let your hair yeah. down a little bit. Yeah, I think yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah. I imagine, I imagine it's the same, or am I right in saying it's, it's the same with alcohol? You can. Yeah, I yeah. think so. If you are craving a drink, 
that's that's not a good sign. Okay. So it, at, at the at the end of the day, what is a positive relationship with alcohol? And I think it's if you can take it or leave it, you don't get drunk, it's not causing any issues in your life, and you're under the recommended amount of, 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 of alcohol per week. So, but I do think some people can have it. But what always jumps back to me is, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be hyper uh, crit- critical here on both sides, jump on both, give the, the pros and the cons. I remember thinking, like at the end of the day, um, the FDA said if alcohol came on the scene right now, the recommended limit would be like a tumbler of a like a little tumbler. That's so it's not a little the pin yeah. needle tumbler, another thing you put in your thumb exactly, like yeah, per yeah. month or something, something ridiculous like that. That'd be the recommended dose per month. Like well, they would not let month. that get it. a month, like something ridiculous that nobody would even bother with it if it came on the scene now. So I'm sort of like, well, then we shouldn't be drinking. But then, like Eckhart Tolle, he was this spiritual teacher and is someone a big, I'm a huge fan of his of his work. And he's like as enlightened as they come. And he has the odd beard. And I'm like, well, if Eckhart can do it, maybe it isn't all that bad. So I think it's very much depends on the person. But yeah, awareness. I, it always comes back to awareness for me. Awareness is the key to be aware of it. Some people give out about dry January, this kind of thing. I don't know. I, I always make sure I do it. I almost like almost like to test myself just to make sure I'm still there's yeah. no issues there. Um, yeah. kind of thing. But this year in particular as well. Like normally, or you might be having a dry January because you've had a maybe there's been a lot of parties to go to in December. Yeah. Because there's a few events coming up in February. So you said, right, I'll just have a nice kind of de- detox of a month in January. Whereas this year, I don't know. I guess I imagine it was the same for for everyone. Where there was very little happening in December, and there was absolutely nothing to yeah. go to in February. So it was almost like, well, why 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 would I even do, bother doing it this year? But I just said, I just look, I just keep myself on a straight and arrow. Just just keep myself in check. Just just do it. What when why not? And and give myself that that yeah. little extra health, that little extra health kick. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I, t- I totally agree. And I think I would come on the side of the fence, coming from addiction, I'd be on the side of the I fence know. of don't go there, you know sure. that way. But I think I think you have to take into account that this is the society we live in. And you, you look at people, there is a lot of people that successfully drink. If there is a way to successfully drink mm-hmm. out there, it seems to be. I, I, sometimes I struggle to understand that. How can people go out for a good few drinks, actually get drunk and get up the next day and function? Mm-hmm. I can't do that. I just know yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. So some people can. I think age dependent as well. It's 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 it's. But again, aware. I think awareness is the key. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Any thoughts for? There'll be a lot, there's a lot of kind of HR leaders, well-being leaders in the workplace listening in here. A lot of workplaces would have, they have policies on, you know, alcohol policy, a drug policy. Is there anything they can do maybe that these leaders from a proactive perspective and uh, maybe to support colleagues? Yeah, I think the best thing they can actually do is to implement some kind of anonymous thing because there's still a huge stigma. Like it's okay to have a drinks and it's it's okay to go on a bender in Ireland for the most part, especially when you're younger, it gets a bit sadder as you get older. But like people, there's a, still a huge stigma around uh, people in addiction. And I, I, I've... I'm starting to very freely talk about my addiction and I, I don't feel stigma because I'm so open about it, but people do personally feel stigma. And if they have a, if they have a, a drink problem themselves and are embarrassed about it, they, they, they'll, they'll lie about it. And when you start lying to other people about it, you'll start lying to yourself. Like you, you will start, that's where self-delusion kicks in. So I think what's really important for, for employers to do is to create some kind of anonymous way for people to reach out. And I'm sure that's what they would do. They wouldn't be asking for a list of people, but yeah. make it as anonymous as possible and make it as obviously anonymous as possible. That Because I think some people are like, oh yeah, but the job are setting up this thing with this crowd and it's going to be anonymous. Yeah, but they'll, they'll know, they'll look at them details. But that's not the way these things work. No. And you could set up, a, set up a way of doing it that it's like 100% anonymous, separate body outside that they can just contact them with a unique ID number. They can give even a fake name. I don't know what way to implement that. Mm-hmm. But make it truly anonymous so people will actually uh, be more inclined to take that first step. And I think that's really cr- cr- critical. Language is so important. Oh, uh, yeah. There's there's a great example of a, a workplace out there where they ha- they hosted an anxiety workshop uh, one week. Hardly anybody turned up. They ran the very same workshop two weeks later. They called it a mental strength 
workshop yeah. and there was a you know it was a really good attendance at it yeah so it, it's it just crazy. shows you that yeah so language is important you know how language you're is but. crucial i'll give you an example as well brian uh, with, with blogging so i be a blogger as well and uh writing stories and it's just the, the power of words so I, I i wrote my book about my first time doing heroin and i remember writing a blog about that and i wrote it um uh, addiction comes in many flavors something or other here's how i fell in love with me first i'm some sort of crappy uh, uh, tile and it basically got zero views i changed that to this is what uh, doing heroin for the first time feels like quarter of a million views to oh, date right. and it's made me like i think I, I, i'm nearly at 10 grand that blog has made oh, me on medium like so just by la the power yeah. of language is absolutely crazy like it really is it's re reframes everything Uh, someone had asked, you know, they, I, can't remember, I can't remember, was it a family member or certainly a close friend who they could see, they believed it clearly had issues with alcohol, but hadn't kind of recognized it or admitted it themselves. And they were asking, like, how do we, or how do I approach this person in as, you know, as compassionate a way as possible? And because they really cared for this person clearly and they wanted them to positively do something about it if you go and start telling people that they have an issue that they need to do this they need to do that they need to go to drink aware any of these things they're going to put up a shield they're going to put up a wall the addictive ego is a f is a monster and it will put up the shield and it will not listen it will go against that so they just won't listen to that so talking is not a good thing to do the, the, one of the best things you can do is to actually listen. If they're willing to talk, try to go in and listen as best you can. And I don't mean listen to reply and listen to tell them what to do to fix their problems because they know they have, they know they have issues. What they need sometimes is just an ear to actually listen so they actually felt heard. So really listen to understand and be that presence for them if they want to talk. But the one thing you can actively do is look after yourself. Because here's the thing, like, let's say somebody is struggling with anxiety and they drink too much, and then you also struggle with anxiety. You're not drinking as much, but you have a few drinks. Well, who are you to tell them what to do? Like, you haven't even got your own house in order. You might be less of an addict than them, but you haven't got your own house in order. So you've got to look after yourself, first and foremost. And when you look after yourself and you be the active listener for that person, well, do you know what they're going to think? Well, I want a bit of what they have, and they listen to my voice. I'm going to go to them. So when they're in a position to look for help, you're going to be in a position to give help. Some people may think, I get a lot of emails of thinking, of people think that they have an, an email exchange with me or a conversation with me, I can fix their addiction woes or the, their family's addiction woes. But even with the experience I have, like I'm doing a PhD in addiction, I've been an addict for years, I teach addiction in, in Trinity College, like I do elements, a lot of elements around that. But if I'm meeting a person and they have addiction issues, I haven't got the solution to their problems. Yeah because their journey is so different than mine and addiction is so complex like people don't drink because they nobody wants to be an addict nobody wants to be an alcoholic it's coming from somewhere else there's an underlying core issue whether it's emotional pain trauma or something else and that's what needs that's our own journey so people have to work in that force so it's always like comorbid is the jargon used in psychology terms with either anxiety depression or other elements as well so it's very complex so it's 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 to understand that yeah you might have a solution for yourself but you haven't got the solution for them and everyone's on a different journey and just listen to their journey i think that's the important message mm -hmm. is it possible to compare addictions like alcohol addiction drug addiction mm -hmm. gambling uh, social media addiction yeah, hundred percent. At the at the end of the day, and it comes back to those habits. Like at the end of the day, every addiction is entwined within the habit. It's triggered by something. There's the behavior of the addiction, whether it's like emotional eating, whether it's picking up your smartphone, whether it's gambling, putting on a bet, and then there's the rewards. So every addiction at its core behaviorally and biologically is the same like it's a dopamine response obviously like with hard drugs like cocaine and, and amphetamines you're actually increasing physically increase in, physically interacting with the neurotransmitters within the brain but at the same time even though smartphones and gambling there's nothing physical about them it's like it's there's nothing biological about them it's still an extra release of dopamine so they're behavioral they're biologically the same all addictions are the same there's subtle differences within each of them as well but you can definitely compare 
compare addictions. I basically think like if heroin wasn't on the scene, I would have been with the traumas that I had in my life. I would have it would have been just alcohol. If if there was no substances around, it would have been something else. Like at the end of the day, you're just trying to get away from yourself. Like there's a reason why you say I want to get out of my head because you can't live there. It's too busy. It's too emotionally charged. So you want to get out of your head because that's what you're trying to avoid. And I think every addiction at the end of the day is has has its core has its essence uh, in there.